Good morning. I'm going to call this Transportation Committee to order. So um, I, I will call the hearing for the Transportation Finance Policy Committee to order today. Today is March 30th, 2023. Um, all hearings are recorded and live streamed. Um, so our first um, uh, agenda item today is um, approval of the minutes. Um, do I have a motion to approve the minutes? Chair P or Representative Petersburg? Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, do need to change the date from March 23rd to March 24th. Other than that, uh, I do approve the minutes with that change. Thank you. All those in favor of the motion, aye. Aye. Uh, aye. All those opposed? <laughs> minutes are approved. All right, with that, we will be hearing a walkthrough and testimony of the DE1 to House File 2887 today. So, um, Representative Horn or Chair Hornstein, welcome to your committee. If you could just uh, walk us through your amendment. Um, I, th I think we're just going to, I'm just going to make some uh, uh, opening comments and then um, we'll have the uh, nonpartisan staff walk us to do the actual walkthrough. Perfect. Thank you. Well, members uh, and uh, uh, others who've gathered here, um, I want to uh, welcome you to the uh, walkthrough and introduction of the uh, 2023 uh, budget bill for transportation. Uh, before I start, I uh, wanted to thank a number of people that have uh, put in so many hours uh, and have responded to many requests, some at, at the last minute here as we put this bill together. Um, we have an incredible staff. Uh, the two uh, rock stars are sitting here to my left. Uh, and I really wanted to thank um, um, Matt Burris and Andy Lee, uh, particularly in the last couple of weeks, but throughout the session have put in long hours and have been so accommodating to member requests, requests from the public. And, and I just want to thank both of you so much. Um, we also have incredible partisan and nonpartisan staff that I want to acknowledge. Uh, Jennifer Nelson, our, our DFL researcher, Joe Marble on the GOP side, again, putting in those long hours, uh, preparing us for these meetings. Um, you, your work is so greatly appreciated. Um, and I also want to thank our uh, intrepid committee administrator, um, Enid Swaggart, who has uh, had to respond to a lot of, uh, uh, I guess, uh, call, audible calls at the line of scrimmage. Is that the football uh, <laughs> analogy? Uh, calling audibles here, uh, particularly the last month. So thank you very much. And um, to all of the members of the committee for your participation. Um, we may have disagreements, but they've always been done in a very respectful, civil way. And um, uh, particularly Representative Petersburg, I want to thank you uh, for your help and, and uh, different process issues that we've worked through uh, this year to make sure that this uh, committee runs effectively and efficiently. Uh, Vice Chair Tapke isn't here, but uh, has done incredible work. And you, Madam Chair, uh, have always stepped up in so much of this bill that we're about to go through has, has uh, your provisions in it, and you've been really a visionary when it comes to uh, innovative funding. So with that, just a couple of very brief introductory comments. Um, members, we are really at a historic crossroads when it comes to transportation. Uh, the federal government has stepped up in a big way because uh, they, like many of us around the table and in the audience, understand that transportation and infrastructure is a key ingredient to a successful society. It is a key ingredient for economic opportunity. Uh, it is a key ingredient to move goods and people around safely. When it comes to addressing our climate crisis and equity issues, transportation is at the heart and the soul of all of this. And members, uh, when I talk about the historic crossroads that we're on, um, when we had the 2021 federal initiative known as IIJA. This was the biggest investment in our infrastructure uh, since Eisenhower built the interstate highway system and the New Deal. It is on par with those two initiatives historically. And so that is why now we have to step up as a state. And that is what we do in the bill that you are about to hear. All modes of transportation are covered, are funded, are dealt with. All parts of the state benefit from this bill. 
We need to make these investments now because if we keep putting them off, the problems don't go away. They simply get more expensive. People will say we can't raise new revenue in a time of surplus. Well, I heard just a few years ago, we can't raise revenue in a time of deficit. There's always an excuse. But now, members, take a look around the roads that we're driving on. This isn't simply just a function of the normal freeze-thaw cycle after a hard winter. This could be our future. When MnDOT came and testified the first couple weeks of session, they said if we don't make major investments, 10% of our roads are going to be in poor condition and many more deteriorating after that. We have been bequeathed an incredible system. 70 years ago, we had visionary leaders in Minnesota that built out um, one of the most extensive transportation systems in the country. That 70-year-old system is now literally crumbling. We cannot, I repeat, cannot continue to procrastinate and come up with half solutions and excuses. The time is now. And finally, members, I want to say that uh, our transit systems are absolutely critical and more essential than ever. And that is why we have a major investment in transit, not simply in the metropolitan area, but throughout the state. We invest in transit systems we know work, are effective, and are efficient at getting people around. Nothing lifts people out of poverty and into a better life than mobility. And we are giving people the opportunity who need that choice, who don't drive for many reasons, uh, a much better transit system where bus routes will come more often and take people to places they need to go. And when transportation is the number one source of greenhouse gas emissions in this climate emergency, investments in transit and active transportation and electric vehicles are more critical than ever. Finally, members, it's not simply about roads and bridges and transit and active transportation. This bill addresses uh, critical needs of our deputy registrars who have, uh, are still recovering from the impacts of COVID. Uh, it addresses rail safety, and I do need to acknowledge that we are in an unfolding uh, disaster in western Minnesota. And we'll be hearing legislation uh, that will be introduced in the Senate tomorrow. Uh, and we'll be hearing that uh, later in the House that addresses that very issue of supporting first responders and communities that are dealing with these types of disasters. And I also want to say that um, there are other parts of this bill that I think are very significant. Um, we make a, a critical investment uh, in small cities in an ongoing way. I, I am aware of uh, some issues that need to be fixed in the first year of funding related to that, and we'll deal with that. That was an issue that six members of the House prioritized and, int and introduced bills on, and many more support. So uh, that is among many of the innovations that we have in this legislation. We'll be hearing a lot more from the public. You'll be hearing a lot more from me uh, here in the next couple of days. Uh, but with, it's with a lot of gratitude to everybody in this room and everybody sitting around the table that I approach this bill today. And Madam Chair, let's start the walkthrough and uh, our public testimony. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, it, who's going to be starting? Mr. Burrs, introduce yourself and uh, proceed with your testimony. Uh, Madam Chair and members, Matt Burris with House Research. I'll be starting off with a introduction to the general structure of the DE amendment, uh, lead all amendment. Uh, this is the document that has an ID in the upper right of H2887DE1. And this is the amendment that would establish the transportation uh, budget for the upcoming two years, as well as uh, contain uh, a number of policy and finance provisions. Uh, a couple of uh, introductory uh, aspects about uh, how legislative budgets are structured. Um, first, the appropriation structure is in Article 1, and it sets up appropriations 
for the uh, upcoming budget biennium. So what you'll see as you uh, look through that article are appropriations in two columns on the right-hand side of the document, and then a number of writers and uh, some specification on the left-hand side, so-called skinny text, uh, that lays out what the purposes are, what limitations uh, there are, or uh, allocations or direction of, of specific dollars. Um, second, the effective date for a uh, bill that has appropriations under a, a statutory provision it defaults to July 1 of 2023. And that is the case for most of the provisions in, in, the, in the delete all amendment, although uh, some sections specify a different effective date. And uh, there's an effective date for Article 5 that's set as August 1 for the entirety of that article. So just uh, so that you're aware of, of when things go into effect, um, that's the general default. Uh, one other thing is uh, just to be aware of with um, the appropriations uh, under another statutory provision, the base for the, the out years, so after fiscal year 2025, uh, that base is set following or based on the appropriation in the second year of the biennium, unless there's uh, a rider that specifies an alternative base. Um, and you'll, you'll see those numbers in the spreadsheet when Mr. Lee um, walks the, the committee through more detail on the appropriations. Mm -hmm. um, and then finally, I might note that there are a number of uh, technical issues in the delete all amendment that we're aware of and uh, will be um, uh, proposed in a, in a technical cleanup amendment during the markup tomorrow. Uh, with that, I'll pass it to, to Mr. Lee to, work, to go through the spreadsheet that highlights all the appropriations that are primarily found in Article 1 of the Delete All Amendment. Thank you. Mr. Lee? Uh, Madam Chair and members, I'll be working off of the legal size uh, landscape spreadsheet that looks like this. It has uh, 19 pages. Um, to orient you to the spreadsheet, uh, the columns on the left-hand side are the title of the base appropriation and changes. Um, then you'll see the uh, 22 23 biennium in column A, um, the base amount for the um, 24 25 biennium, that's the upcoming biennium for which the legislature is budgeting for. And then you'll see a series of columns for the governor's recommendations. Uh, this was in House File uh, 19, or, yeah, 1992. Um, and then the proposed DE amendment are the columns furthest to the right. Um, you'll see, uh, starting to how to read this, um, the first few lines, uh, line 14 and 15, um, using as an example uh, for aeronautics, you'll see those are the two base appropriations amounts. And then um, the proposed changes in both the governor's recs and the DE amendment, uh, you'll see on line 17 and 18. Um, I don't have time to go through every single change item, um, but I'll highlight um, some of the larger, more unique ones. Um, and also point out that there's a structure uh, where several of these items um, have both governor's recommendations and appropriation increases in the DE amendment that are related to um, uh, uh, inflationary costs. Um, so just to note, you'll see that throughout the spreadsheet. Um, so the first change items um, you'll see on 17 and 18 related to airport development assistance. These are both one-time general fund appropriations. Then you'll see a series of um, uh, increases on line 27 and 29 for aviation support services. Um, so you can see uh, the maintain current service levels, as I said before, that's like the inflationary increase. Um, and then a utility aircraft replacement on line 29. Uh, moving then to um, transit and active transportation, you can see a one-time appropriation in the DE of 10 million for active transportation. Uh, on line 50, you can see the establishment of a base for uh, transportation management organization grants. And moving to the next page, on line 57, you can see a one-time appropriation for safe routes to school, and that's an increase over the $500,000 annual base. Um, then on line 64, you can see a one-time appropriation for the Northern Lights Express project. On line um, uh, 65, you can see an increase to the passenger rail office as an ongoing base appropriation increase. 
Uh, and then you can see both a governor's rec and a proposed um, DE increase for a second daily train to Chicago operating costs increases on line 66. Uh, then you can see a series of change of um, changes on lines 74 through 79 for freight. And I'll just note that on line 78 and 79, uh, these are showing um, changes in um, what would be statutory appropriations. So unlike the rest of the changes in the spreadsheet where you see a notation that says statutory, it means that it's not a direct appropriation, but um, a spending increase as a result in change in policy that has a statutory appropriation attached to it. Um, moving on to state roads on page three. You can see a series of changes um, for both maintain current service levels um, appropriation increase and the uh, multimodal transportation package um, on line 45, 40, 94 and uh, 95. And then a series of changes relating to highways for habitat, living snow fences, and safe road zones. Uh, under planning and research, you can see the maintain current service levels increase. And then under program um, delivery, um, you can see the maintain current service levels, a multimodal package, uh, then a uh, federal transportation climate funding appropriation, and a one-time rural high-risk roadways appropriation. Under state road construction, this is the largest uh, appropriation to MnDOT. Uh, you can see a series of increases and um, a few one-time one items, the living snow fences, and the high-priority intersection conversion. Um, and also a one-time appropriation for work zone speed mitigation over two years. Then the next um, change item is on line 142, a debt service increase. Uh, and then two change items under state radio communications on line 149 and 150. Under local roads, uh, these, the uh, county state aid highway and the municipal state aid street appropriations are increases as a result of more revenue going to the highway user tax distribution fund. Um, and so you can see on line uh, 165 and 174, those increases. Then there's a few other local road um, appropriation increases. The first is town roads, and I should mention that um, this isn't the total increase going to town roads. Uh, as they also have some formula um, increase in um, what is part of the county state aid highway appropriation. There's a separate spreadsheet that, uh, that um, shows that in more detail. Uh, and then um, you can see two approaches to small cities assistance. Um, the governor's um, column, there's a one-time $40 million appropriation. And in the proposed DE, there is a um, appropriation um, uh, that is uh, ongoing on line 183. Then a one-time appropriation for the Rice Street Capital Area redesign and a governor's rec for local transportation disaster support that's also carried in the DE amendment. Under agency management, you can see a series of changes, um, several related to maintaining current service levels. Uh, the largest uh, items I'll point your attention to is on line 206, the federal matching for IAJA discretionary grants. Uh, this is a slightly different approach from the governor's recommendation. Uh, and then a series of federal funding uh, appropriations, tribal relations workforce training program, and uh, IT investments uh, ending on line 210. Uh, then there is a... Um, a new appropriation for electric vehicle infrastructure with a one-time $13.6 million appropriation in fiscal 2024 and ongoing, appropriate, or ongoing general fund appropriations uh, that you can see on line 220. Under buildings, there's maintained current service levels increase on line 227. Uh, then moving on to the Metropolitan Council on page 7. Uh, you can see one appropriation in fiscal 2023 for the transit safety um, improvement program uh, and another one-time appropriation of $1 million on line 264 for land use and transportation studies, uh, a transportation study. Uh, I should note that um, in the um, small revenue spreadsheet, you can see um, that uh, there is also a, um, a, a metro area sales tax um, that um, 
generate significant revenue um, for the Metropolitan Council um, and, and Metro Area Transit um, so that, but it's not directly appropriated. And I'll get to that later in the spreadsheet. Then moving on to page eight with uh, Department of Public Safety change items. You can see a number of administrative increases um, starting on communications on line 275 to 277. And then for the public safety support appropriation, you can see a number of um, governor's recommended change items that are also carried in the DE amendment on lines 284 through 293. Um, and on page nine are some more administrative uh, functions for the Department of Public Safety. And you can see a change item um, on line 315 and 316. That is also a governor's recommendation. Moving on to the State Patrol, on page 10, you can see a number of uh, both governor's recommendations um, for um, maintaining current service levels and other uh, initiatives. Uh, the one difference that I will note is on line 333 and 334, the governor recommends funding the additional State Patrol helicopter from general fund and the DE has it from trunk highway fund. Um, then you can see some more um, maintain current service levels um, on line uh, 346 um, and a commercial vehicle enforcement uh, measure on 347. Um, uh, maintain current service levels for capital security on 354 and for vehicle crimes on 361. Um, and then moving on to Department of Driver and Vehicle Services on page 11. Um, there are uh, the, the governor's level for maintain current uh, service levels on line 375 and 368 for the two divisions, um, and then some separate initiatives um, for race and ethnicity information, um, uh, exam staffing, and the cost indicated or the cost associated with House File uh, 949. Uh, then you can see Deputy Registrar Aid on line 389, that's a one-time $6 million appropriation spread over two years. Uh, then moving to traffic safety, you can see a series of changes. Um, and um, some of which are maintained current service levels and some of which are new initiatives contained in the DE amendment. And you can see those on line 408 through 412. And you can see uh, governor's uh, change item that's also in the DE amendment on line uh, 421 for pipeline safety. Um, then on page 13, there are a number of other uh, appropriations, uh, whether statutory or uh, direct. Um, the first is uh, to the legislature for Metropolitan Governance Task Force, a one-time $225,000 general fund appropriation. Uh, then on line 445 and 446, uh, appropriations to Minnesota Management and Budget for a Federal Funds Coordinator and for the costs associated with law enforcement officer collective bargaining. Uh, then you can see a few statutory appropriations uh, to the Department of Revenue. Uh, the first on line 453 is a result of tax interactions for increased regional borrowing authorization for the Metropolitan Council. Uh, and the second two are um, costs associated with um, the retail delivery fee and the transit area sales tax district. And I should note that um, um, those statutory appropriations may have to be updated as the rates are different from the um, governor's rate. Um, so that might be a change. Uh, then, um, you can see on uh, page 14 um, that this is recognizing a statutory appropriation um, for legislation contained in the DE relating to public um, uh, uh, road uh, high voltage line um, permitting changes. Uh, this is a statutory appropriation from a special revenue account in the Department of Commerce. And then a statutory appropriation in the Department of Human Services related to the delivery fee. Um, as you can see, agency appropriation totals 
And then on page 15, um, there's a major transfer in both the governor's recommendation and the DE amendment. Uh, that is a one-time transfer from the general fund to the trunk highway fund. Uh, in the DE amendment, it is 383 point, um, about six uh, million in fiscal 2024. Uh, then the uh, spreadsheet starts with revenue items. Um, so you can see uh, the first is the revenue item change to the registration tax, um, then a change um, to the um, general fund sales tax that's attributed to, to auto parts on line uh, 499 and 500, and then a change to the motor vehicle sales tax rate. That's on line, starting on line 502. And then... Um, the retail delivery fee on line 507. Um, and then there is a governor's rec and also carried in the DE amendment of a fine redirection for rail crossing safety and a railroad um, uh, inspector assessment. Now turning to the next page, you can see the um, metro area sales tax and the DE is proposed to be a total of uh, 0.75, and as you can see the revenue um, on line 522. Then under the Department of Public Safety, you can see a series of governor's changes and also carried in the DE amendment uh, related to uh, driver and vehicle services. Um, one difference that I will note is on line 528, the filing fee increase uh, is slightly different. And this is the filing fee increase maintained, or um, kept by uh, DVS for transactions that go through DVS as opposed to transactions that go through the deputy registrars. Um, and then there's a number of um, filing fee redirections from the general fund to um, transportation uses that you can see on page um, or on line 534 starting there. Uh, then on 539, there's a series of transfers and changes related to um, the reintegration license. Um, uh, because of uh, changes proposed in that language, uh, certain funds are estimated to receive less revenue. So there's a one-time transfer from the general fund to make those funds whole for uh, four years. Uh, under Department of Revenue, you can see the statutory appropriations for administering um, uh, tax changes. Um, and then some small um, estimated costs for Minnesota Management and Budget and the Supreme Court related to um, the change for administrative citations. Uh, then on page 17, you can see the total HUTD changes. Um, and I just noticed an error on the spreadsheet online. 568, uh, there should be a number where it's in fiscal 2025 for municipal state aid streets. Uh, moving to page 18, this is a summary of uh, general fund changes, the general fund appropriations. Um, right at the bottom of um, the page, uh, you can see the uh, total fiscal 2023-25 uh, biennium um, spend and the target and um, that math. And then you can see the above base spending for the um, uh, second biennium, the 26-27 biennium, this is the base set in the DE amendment at about uh, 129.3 million. That's above base. On the last page, uh, there are a series of notes and a comparison of the trunk highway bond proposals. Uh, and I will conclude um, that if you'd like more detail on the tax uh, proposals, um, there's also a four-page um, letter uh, sheet that has uh, a summary of those. Thank you. Mr. Burris? Uh, Madam Chair and members, moving back to the language, uh, in the interest of time, I won't go section by section, but we'll uh, provide some highlights and endeavor to uh, note some of the changes in provisions that are in the DE in comparison to what had been heard in committee. Uh, first, uh, Article 1 contains the appropriations that Mr. Lee has um, just walked through. And um, as I described the structure, um, it, it occurred to me there are some sections later in Article 1 where there are standalone appropriations that, that don't follow that structure. Um, that's largely to accommodate uh, fiscal year 2023 appropriations. So some, um, some of the funding is, is um, 
uh, made available immediately after enactment for, for yet this fiscal year. Uh, moving to some of the changes that are in the DE amendment, uh, the first involves the Federal Transportation Grants Assistance Program. This is on page 36, um, starting at uh, roughly line 24 on page 36. Uh, there's some adjustments to the requirements and the uh, assistance um, so that there's uh, percentages set for reserved funds. Um, the next provision with a modification is in section 16, which is on IIJA discretionary match. <clears throat> um, there was a blank uh, in the original bill and that is now uh, filled in and adjusted. And this is on uh, page 38, lines 14 and 15, um, part of the, the allocation requirements for discretionary match funds. Um, and then moving to page 39, section 18 has some modifications to a um, traffic citations disposition analysis. And it um, shifts the analysis to be under contract between the Department of Public Safety and the Center for Transportation Studies and broadens um, some of the types of citations that would be uh, analyzed as part of the analysis uh, activities. Um, moving then to the um, bonding article, which is Article 2. Um, just to provide, uh, a, a, again, a little bit of high-level context, um, the trunk highway bonds are authorized in this article. This starts on page 40. Uh, the, the total bonding authorization is about 217.4 million, and that is divided between uh, funding for the Quarters of Commerce program at 50 million, high priority bridges at 80 million, and uh, Department of Transportation capital facilities at 87.4 million. Uh, so the article contains the appropriations of bond proceeds as well as the authorization for trunk highway bonding. Um, and then there's a, an appropriation to Minnesota management and budget for the bond sale expenses. Uh, Article 3 starts on page 42. This contains uh, a number of the uh, tax and fee provisions that are in the delete all amendment. Um, so within this article, there is a registration tax change um, to the uh, rate depreciation schedule um, structure. The retail delivery fee is also in this article, along with the increase in the rate of the motor vehicle sales tax and reallocation of the, of the uh, transit portion of the motor vehicle sales tax split. Uh, one of the changes that is in the DE amendment can be found on page 47. Uh, this is section nine and would establish a new account, a transportation advancement account. And that account would hold the revenue from the retail delivery fee, as well as a couple of portions of filing fee revenue that is being redirected from deposit in the general fund. So it would instead go to in, into this account. And then there's a um, set of percentages uh, at the top of page 48 for where those funds are allocated to various um, transportation funds and accounts. So the direct appropriations that are in Article 1 and that Mr. Lee had walked through um, reflect in part the funding that comes as a result of this allocation. Uh, moving to the um, next provision where there are changes, this is on uh, section 13. The changes are on page 51 at the, at the bottom of the page. This provision reallocates an additional portion of general sales tax revenue that's attributed to automotive repair and replacement parts. Uh, and it, it creates a phase in so that for fiscal years 24 through 2027, uh, an additional portion of that revenue is allocated to the highway user tax distribution fund. And it sets it up so that starting in fiscal year 2028, the entirety of this attributed revenue would go into the HETD. Uh, the next change is on page um, 56, or starting on that, section 18. This has some modifications to the uses of the 
um, uh, metropolitan region sales tax that's authorized in the in the bill. The core of the change is to allocate a portion of that sales tax revenue um, to the uh, Transportation Advisory Board and give direction to the Transportation Advisory Board on allocating those funds uh, following something parallel to the processes that it currently uses. And the do dollars are directed towards highway projects. And then the remainder is directed to transit in the metropolitan area. And the Met Council um, has some, some legislative direction in this. You can see it on page 57 uh, that uh, identifies some priority uses of the transit funds. And then the, the next uh, set of changes are uh, in Article 4, which contains a variety of policy and finance provisions. That article starts on page 58. Uh, the first uh, set of changes is in the first section. Uh, you'll see that at uh, the top of page 60, <coughs> so starting at 60.4, there are some additions to the and, and removals of uh, with the uh, membership on the Advisory Council on Traffic Safety that's being established in the bill. Um, and then the next change is found on page 69, and this relates to uh, both contracting and re reimbursement provisions for utility relocation in trunk highway rights of way. Uh, so sections 8 and 9 on page 69 are are added in the delete all amendment. Uh, and then next on page 71, <coughs> section 12, there's a, a change in how the request process is initiated for the uh, safe road zones establishment. Um, so it, it, it uh, modifies um, how who, who the entities are in um, submitting that request. Uh, and then uh, there's also a change on the, in the speed limit provision that goes along with the state road zones. That's in section 13 of the, of the DE amendment. Uh, moving on to page 77, uh, section 18 combines two different governor's recommendations. One had traveled uh, in a uh, policy bill and the other was in, in the, the governor's recommended budget. Um, this is on remote and online um, or mailed uh, applications for driver's license renewals. Um, this modification uh, sort of merges the, the two different proposals. Um, so you can see uh, 79.3, uh, the addition of um, a process for renewals for a person who is incarcerated, incarcerated under some circumstances. Uh, moving next to page... 87, there were a couple of different proposals heard by the committee this year regarding merger of accounts in driver and vehicle services or establishment of a new fund. Uh, the approach in the delete all amendment is to um, merge accounts but add reporting requirements. Um, those can be found um, on page 86 starting at line 16. So it would be additional specification about the finances uh, for the, the newly merged accounts. Uh, the next change is on page 108, and this is to the Metropolitan Governance Task Force that's uh, being established in the bill. Um, there's some modifications to the membership on page uh, 108, starting at uh, line 21. And there's also a, a, a shift in the compensation. So there's a reference to existing uh, statute on compensation. That's found in a new subdivision six on page 109, line 28. And then on page 111, section 52, there's some modifications to a legisl le legislative report on speed safety cameras. Um, this is to adjust the date uh, due date of the report and also to make modifications to uh, conform to the, um, to the fact that there's not a, a pilot program. So it would just be reporting on um, the, the policy questions. But there, there isn't an associated pilot that's proposed in the delete all amendment. 
Uh, and then on page 121, actually, I'll, sorry, I'll back up a step since we're moving into Article 5. Um, Article 5 is, starts on page 112. This contains a number of provisions that are proposed in response to the independent expert review from a couple of years ago. And one of the modifications um, compared to what had been proposed is found on page 121. Uh, this would retain some of the current law requirements around uh, exam locations, um, and, but uh, would um, propose uh, requirements on real-time information. Um, and that, Mr. Chair, is a, a high-level overview of the delete all amendment. We're available for any further questions. Thank you very much. I'm sorry I missed it, but uh, I'm sure you did great work. Uh, Chair Hornstein, do you have anything to add before we uh, start with test fires? No, I just want to again uh, thank the staff. And I, uh, in my rush and, and passion to uh, summarize the bill, I forgot to uh, thank a very, very important person on our committee, our committee legislative assistant, Kevin Petrie, sits over in the corner and does incredible work here, both in the office and in the committee. So I want to thank Mr. Petrie as well. And I think that we have a lot of test, uh, people that want to testify, and maybe, uh, Mr. Chair, I'm very curious and anxious to hear what uh, the interested parties in transportation have to say about the bill. All right, thank you very much. So we will uh, get this started with uh, commissioners first. So Commissioner Dobbenberger from Department of Transportation will be first. And it looks like we have Mr. Rudine. Please state your name for the record and uh, proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Eric Rudin with MnDOT Government Affairs, and Commissioner Daubenberger sends her regrets for not being here uh, in person, but she is on her way to the train derailment that the chair uh, referenced earlier in western Minnesota. I mean, probably is there already, in fact. So I'll be uh, speaking on her behalf this morning. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to provide comments on this bill. And as we noted earlier this session, MnDOT is projecting a transportation funding gap of up to $27 billion over the next 20 years, just for construction needs on the trunk highway system. And the overall need for transportation is significantly larger than that number. That gap reflects the impact of inflation as well as new goals in areas such as pedestrian and bicycle facilities, freight, and reducing per capita vehicle miles traveled. And as we look to the future, uh, we are anxious to partner with the legislature to help close that gap and make robust investments in Minnesota's uh, infrastructure and multimodal transportation system. So we're very pleased to see that this bill makes strong investments in several critical areas of the state's multimodal transportation network. We appreciate the committee's work on looking at the registration uh, fee and other sources of revenue to help fill the, the transportation funding gap with ongoing dedicated revenues. In particular, uh, we'd like to thank you for providing the matching funds for IIJA to help MnDOT, local units of government, and other eligible entities compete for discretionary grants. And we're confident that the funding levels proposed by the House will help maximize uh, the, the uh, use of available funds under IIJA. We're also pleased to see that language uh, related to implementing the electric vehicle infrastructure program under IIJA is included in the bill. Uh, there's also an investment for maximizing federal uh, climate uh, programs in, in the bill, which is uh, supported by the Sustainable Transportation Advisory uh, Committee and included in the governor's recommendations. Uh, I won't list all of the uh, governor's initiatives that are included in the bill, but I just want to thank the chair and the committee for including uh, several of those, uh, including um, funding for passenger rail, uh, aeronautic systems, rail crossing safety, tribal affairs training, uh, and um, working with local governments for uh, disaster uh, relief spending. Thank you for uh, addressing the concerns that we raised in the Highways for Habitat language. There is uh, just one small uh, potential outstanding issue related to Highways for Habitat and the control of noxious weeds. And um, we're, we're uh, looking to maybe clarify that uh, the, the language in the bill uh, would not um, impact our ability to, to control noxious weeds. I'd like to share some comments briefly on the um, provisions in Article 4, Section 6 related to greenhouse gas emissions. As we know, transportation is the number one source of carbon pollution uh, in Minnesota. And we 
at MnDOT have adopted goals to reduce uh, carbon pollution uh, about 80% uh, by 2050, and we've strengthened these goals, goals based on stakeholder feedback in the update to our statewide multimodal transportation plan. Uh, electric vehicles and lower carbon fuels will help uh, play a role in decreasing emissions, but those alone will not uh, get us to meeting our goals. So that's why we've also adopted a target for reducing vehicle miles traveled. And uh, we do intend to invest, make additional investments in other transporta transportation options that will help us uh, reduce uh, uh, greenhouse gas emissions. So uh, we're still actually reviewing some of the, the provisions uh, that were in Representative Kraft's uh, proposal, um, and, and we'll, we'll continue to, to work with you on, on those as the bill moves forward. Um, but specifically, um, you know, we, we do environmental assessment uh, at the planning stage of projects uh, when information uh, is available through the uh, MEPA and NEPA process. Uh, that that is already done for projects, and so uh, just making sure that the language works within that process, um, I think, is is something that we'll we'll continue to to work on. We do appreciate the delayed effective date of, of 2025 to help us uh, work through some of those issues. Uh, on utility relocation, uh, we appreciate the inclusion of of safety um, in in uh, that language. Uh, we, we are still looking at uh, the language about who is responsible for those costs, and so we appreciate the opportunity to continue to address that. Uh, we were hoping for some legislative direction on uh, regional balance within the Quarters of Commerce program, and so uh, we, we would hope that that could be addressed perhaps through other legislation. Um, okay, <laughs> very good. Um, the, uh, as the bill progresses, uh, we, we do uh, point out that the governor had a recommendation on sustainable aviation fuel that, that we would lead in, in conjunction with the Department of Agriculture. Um, and then finally, uh, just a concern about the, uh, the rail corridor uh, work, on the, especially on the Fargo to Moorhead line. Um, the, the legislation currently requires uh, that a plan be completed by January 15th of next year with a report due by February 1st, and, and we're just not sure that's quite feasible. Um, we estimate that to, to do the work uh, spelled out in the bill would take approximately two years. So we would look forward to working with you um, and, and others on that. So uh, with that, Mr. Chair, I, I want to thank you again very much for um, the historic investments included in this bill, and uh, we look forward to, to working with you further as the bill progresses. Thank you very much, Mr. Rudine. Uh, next up, we have uh, Deputy Commissioner Cassandra O'Hearn from the Department of Safety, and then uh, Chair Zelli from Met Council. Thank you very much for being here. Please state your name for the record and proceed. And if you can keep it three to five minutes, I'd very much appreciate it. I can do that. Thank My you. name is Cassandra O'Hearn. I'm the Deputy Commissioner for the Department of Public Safety. Commissioner Jacobson sends his regrets that he cannot be here this morning. He is also um, on his way or at uh, Raymond, Minnesota, uh, as we speak. Um, today, I'm grateful to be here, and I want to thank uh, Chair Hornstein, uh, Vice Chair Tapke, um, lead Petersburg and all of the members of this committee for this bill and the work uh, that you have done. We are very grateful for the significant investments to our agency, which makes Minnesota roads safer, transportation more accessible, and driver and vehicle services more customer focused. The substantial investments in our agency uh, includes funding many of the initiatives and the proposals from the governor and the lieutenant governor's budget recommendations. Funding to maintain our current level of services helps ensure that we can keep our current staff and meet the needs that Minnesotans have right now. But we have also discovered that there are many needs that we are not meeting, and so it is very important and we appreciate uh, the investment in our administrative demands as they have grown to help our communications department our human resources, and grow our fiscal, excuse me, our fiscal teams so that we can better monitor state funds and provide uh, timely reports to the legislature. <laughs> our investment in community engagement will also be absolutely transformational. Currently, we have one individual who is working all across the state in this area, and she does great work. 
but she is only one person. And so being able to invest uh, really can bring that community engagement to our work. The bill makes smart strategic investments, and I want to highlight just a couple. Uh, with the state patrol, the new helicopter will expand our search and rescue capabilities while additional pilots help the needs of communities across Minnesota. Providing funding for commercial vehicle enforcement allows the patrol to uh, get additional federal funding and hire more sworn and non-sworn staff. The funding of the CALEA uh, accreditation ensures that the state patrol continues to be state-of-the-art law enforcement here in the state. And also, uh, thank you for including the pre-design work for the new state patrol headquarters. The Office of Traffic Safety has um, significant support from this uh, committee, and we really appreciate the investment in uh, the Traffic Safety Data, data Analytics Center, as well as the Traffic Safety Council. Pipeline safety has been an issue that we have heard a lot about this year. The funding for additional staff in the Office of Pipeline Safety will be used for education, investigation, and enforcement and oversight of important pipeline and utility laws. So thank you for that, but I would like to note that the committee consider putting the federal compliance language that was heard in House File 2887 into this bill. Without that language, the Office of Pipeline Safety will lose some of its federal authority. And it's really important to keep Minnesota safe in that regard. With respect to driver and vehicle services, thank you for many of our change items, including the revenue items to stabilize the health of the special revenue accounts, combining the accounts, and raising filing fees for deputy registrars. In the past calendar year, driver vehicle services was able to complete more road tests for both CDL and Class D than they have ever done before, and the continued funding of DVS exam stations will help ensure that we can continue to do that. We'd like to continue our conversation about a different way to fund staffing to ensure that we don't create a fiscal cliff in the future. New vehicle inspection sites are absolutely needed. This is an area we are not currently keeping up with demand at all, and uh, the strong investment in this bill will help do that. DPS strongly supports the voluntary collection of race and ethnicity data on credential applications. This data will be very uh, important in being able to uh, do traffic safety um, uh, studies and information uh, to, to help. I do need to point out one concern that we have with the required payments to deputy registrars out of the special revenue account. Driver's license agents and deputy registrars are vital partners in delivering services to Minnesotans. But the model that the state has necessitates that they are paid for the work that they do through filing fees. If deputies require additional funds to meet their needs, we believe that this should be accomplished through the setting of filing fees to properly com compensate them for the important work that they do, and they should be paid for that work. Finally, I just want to say thank you once again and appreciate continuing to uh, our conversations on this bill as it moves forward. Thank you so much. You. Next we have Chair Zelli, followed by uh, Keith Nelson from St. Louis County. Chair Zelli, thank you for being here. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and committee members. My name is Charlie Zelli, Chair of the Metropolitan Council. And it's a great honor to be uh, here today and uh, also um, as uh, uh, mentioned by others, I'm deeply appreciative of the work of this legislation and uh, the work of the committee. Um, <clears throat> as, uh, as I testified earlier, the governor has recommended a one-eighth uh, cent percent uh, metro area sales tax, uh, but it was really important uh, that uh, he also has indicated he is very open to to a larger rate, so uh, as indicated by this legislation. So we're very much appreciative. Um, we look forward over the weeks and uh, month ahead to kind of work through many of the details uh, to ensure that this area has the robust, sustainably funded uh, transit system that, uh, that we envision. Um, <clears throat> also, uh, the governor's budget did uh, recommend uh, funding to match some II 
uh, JA opportunities, such as the low, no uh, uh, investments in, uh, in, 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 in buses, uh, providing uh, increased transit safety and security, and also uh, providing uh, funds for transit bonds uh, as part of our uh, effort to renew the regional transit fleet. Um, I'm sure and I'm confident we can work to, uh, with the committee uh, again in the weeks ahead to ensure that those important needs um, uh, are addressed. Uh, I want to just take this moment to especially uh, thank uh, you, uh, Representative Tabke and Representative Elkins, uh, for including and, uh, and uh, advocating for the administrative citations initiative uh, that are in this, uh, in this bill. Uh, as you may know, the council has been uh, working on this issue for over five years. It is really an important element <coughs> as we address safety and security in the, in the, uh, in the, ra in the rail system especially. I'd um, also like to acknowledge uh, Representative Tabke's efforts on his uh, TRIP program. Um, uh, that, that The proposed interventions are very consistent with what the governor has been recommending and what we are looking toward which is really working cooperatively with other agencies, other law enforcement agencies, other uh, social service agencies, uh, to address those issues that, though didn't start on transit, have come to transit in such a significant way. And we have to be both urgent and long-term in how we address those, um, uh, those really important uh, um, you know, safety uh, concerns. Um, with that, uh, I will be brief, uh, but end by especially thanking, thanking Chair Hortstein. Your vision for transit uh, is best uh, heard from you. Uh, I will talk about an interconnected system, how important our aspirations, our vitality as a metro area, as a state, really depends upon public transportation working well, work, being welcoming, being safe, and being fully uh, 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 Funded and uh, this uh, bill has really represents uh, not only a financial investment but a value investment in uh, in our future. So to which I thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair Zelli. So now uh, we go into uh, public testimony, and so we've got uh, Keith Nelson from St. Louis County, then Marion Green from uh, Hennepin County. And what we're going to do here is we uh, need to finish by 10 o'clock, and so we've got 90 seconds for each testifier here. So uh, with uh, Mr. Nelson, uh, Commissioner Nelson sitting up there, if, uh, Commissioner Green will also go up at this point. Um, and then when we have uh, tell who's on deck, please go up and sit uh, next to the testifier who's te who is uh, speaking at that point. So thank you very much, uh, Mr. Nelson. Please state your name for the record and proceed. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. My name is Keith Nelson. Um, I am a St. Louis County Commissioner, uh, Vice Chair of the Board, and Chair of Finance and Budget uh, in St. Louis County now for nearly 20 years. Um, first of all, I want to thank Chair Hornstein um, for his vision. Um, I'm speaking to you specifically today uh, in regards to the Northern Lights Express. And I might add that right on cue and as if showing off for this world, uh, the Northern Lights have been quite prevalent the last several days. Um, but uh, it, is, it is truly um, an investment that I think the time is, is right uh, for Northeastern Minnesota and for the state of Minnesota uh, in passenger rail. Um, and, it, and I know uh, it takes vision, it takes courage, um, but this is something that will bring economic development, it will bring workforce development, um, it will be transformative to uh, the effects that it will have on northeastern Minnesota and the state as a whole. Thank you very much for your time today. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Uh, Marion Green, followed by Gordy Wagner. Thank you, Chair Tabke, Chair Hornstein, members. My name is Marion Green. I'm Hennepin County Commissioner for District 3 and Chair of the Hennepin County Regional Rail Authority. Thank you for the opportunity to be here. This bill makes a historic investment in Minnesota's transit infrastructure while addressing climate change and racial equity. The Metro sales tax for transit provides stable funding to end the constant budget crisis and meet the region's growing needs. Quality transit is key to providing vibrant, connected communities, increasing access to jobs, reducing disparities, equitable travel options, saves people time and money, whether they like the train, the bus, or prefer to drive on less congested roads. It drives economic prosperity and improves competitiveness. 
and it's essential to combating climate change. We have to reduce our individual car use to meet climate goals, and transit with SPART development has proven that it can do that. Hennepin County is ready to partner with you to deliver a comprehensive transit network with high frequency transit way lines like light rail and bus rapid transit. Projects like the Blue Line extension are generational investments in our transportation system and leverage billions of dollars from the federal government. They also employ thousands of good paying construction jobs and ignite economic development unlike any other form of infrastructure. The new road and bridge revenue in this bill will help meet Hennepin's 30 million annual gap to maintain our system. We hope we can continue the conversation to fix the motor vehicle lease sales tax distribution for equitable and shared Metro road and bridge funding. This is especially important as Metro communities will be required to make the greatest DMT reductions. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Thank you very much, I appreciate it. Uh, Commissioner Wagner from Polk County. Followed by Margaret Donho from Transportation Alliance. Good to see you. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Gordy Wagner. I've been a Polk County Commissioner, population of 11,000 Polk County is for 15 years and currently serve as a chair of the Association of Minnesota Counties Transportation Policy Committee. On behalf of AMC and the Minnesota County Engineers Association, we want to offer our support for the revenue increases included in the DE1 amendment to House File 2887. AMC and MCEA have long advocated for the statewide need for increased transportation dollars. One of our top priorities this year and for the past several years is support for a comprehensive transportation funding bill that includes new dedicated revenue for roads, bridges, and transit. We know it's hard to increase revenues while the state is experiencing a record surplus, but transportation revenues are down. The HUTD fund is down 2.5% from last year, which means the CASA fund receives $17.5 million less in 2023 than 2022. Adequate, dedicated annual funding through the HUTD fund is critical and of the highest priorities for counties and particularly rural counties such as mine without rural, without major population centers. We support the revenue increases included in the bill, including the registration tax rate increase, rate equalization of the motor vehicle sales tax, additional revenue from the auto parts sales tax going into the HUTD fund and the 75 cent delivery fee. As for the delivery fee, we consider this a user fee that will help pay for the wear and tear on our roads and is a fair approach given the significant increase in delivery vehicles on the system. We especially want to thank you for including a dedicated portion of the delivery fee to the CASA fund. On behalf of counties, I would like to thank Chair Hausman and all members of the committee <laughs> for your work on this bill and for your commitment to transportation funding this session. Thank you for the opportunity to testify today. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. Next, we have uh, Margaret Donahoe from Transportation Alliance, followed by Amber Backus from uh, the Automo Dealers, uh, Automobile Dealers Association. Thank you, Mr. Chair. For the record, my name is Margaret Donahoe, Director of the Minnesota Transportation Alliance. On behalf of the member organizations of the Transportation Alliance, I would like to thank Chair Hornstein and uh, all the members of the committee for working with the people who plan, design, construct, and operate Minnesota's transportation system in developing this bill. Um, as you know, and as the chair said, we really are at a crossroads with the transportation system. We continue to see more and more deterioration of our roads, structurally deficient bridges, safety problems on our roads, and transit systems that struggle to meet people's needs. Transportation revenue is falling behind. Inflation is eating away at the purchasing power of the dollars that we have. And you, we all can see the results on our transportation system, which will get worse without action. The funding in this bill is critical. 
the general fund dollars to match IIJA money, the trunk highway bonds, the transfer of general fund money, and the revenue increases. We really do need the delivery fee included in this bill with allocations to county, city, and township roads. We need the license tab fee adjustment as we see that revenue source is down. Uh, we need the metropolitan area sales tax provided in this bill for both transit and highway investments in the metropolitan area. We need the equalization of MVEST and we absolutely need the full dedication of the sales tax on auto repair parts. In order to plan, design, and construct projects in a cost-effective manner, we need stable, dedicated, ongoing revenue. We urge you to pass this bill and work to ensure that all of the funding is ultimately passed and signed into law. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, now we have Amber Bacchus from uh, Minnesota Automobile, Automobile Dealers Association, followed by Grace Waltz. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Amber Backus. I'm here on behalf of the Minnesota Automobile Dealers Association and its 375 franchise new car and truck dealers located across the state. And we do want to thank the committee for its work on this bill and appreciate the inclusion of the local match for the federal NEVI dollars. We need a robust and visible charging network on highway corridors to increase consumer confidence in EVs so people know that they can reliably, reliably get across the state as easily as they can across their local communities. And these dollars will help get us there. We also want to acknowledge the pressures on transportation revenues, which aren't seeing the gains of the general fund. We did share some ideas with Chair Hornstein on ways to raise additional transportation dollars without raising the rates of tab fees and motor vehicle sales taxes, especially since vehicle prices are increasing due to new technologies and increased electrification of the fleet. The fleet excuse me. Specifically, I'd like to speak to the increase in the MVES contained in this bill. Ms. Donahoe convincingly spoke to how the revenues are not keeping up with forecasts. This may be true, especially since COVID caused some major market abnormalities, but that doesn't mean MVEST is producing less revenue, and I'd like to direct your attention to a handout in your packets. In 2019, the state had a record number of new car sales, generating $486 million in MVEST for, for the Highway Trust Fund. Last year, new car sales plummeted to their lowest level in over a decade, yet MVEST revenues were at the highest levels yet, $592 million. So despite dropping 28% in sales, MVEST revenues increased by 22% in just three years. In the coming year, vehicle sales are projected to increase, but vehicle prices aren't expected to drop. We'd ask the committee to stick with Minnesota's current MVEST rate, which has shown growth even during tough economic times, and reject an increase that would make Minnesota the fifth highest motor vehicle sales tax in the country. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now we have Grace Waltz from the Minneapolis Regional Chamber of Commerce, followed by Bentley Graves. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. My name is Grace Waltz, and I serve as the Vice President of Public Policy at the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. The Minneapolis Regional Chamber has long advocated for increased investments in our transit and transportation systems, and we know transit investments are critical for the economic well-being of our region and state. A 2019 Chamber Commission report found that regional transit investments provide a 300% return on investment from vehicle cost savings, travel time savings, safety improvements, and emissions reductions, among other benefits. Additionally, transit Transit improvements provide expanded access to opportunity for thousands of Minnesotans and an expanded potential workforce for regional employers. Specifically, we want to thank this committee for including funding for the Minneapolis Duluth Northern Lights Express, IIJA Federal Match, funding for local transportation management organizations, and the various investments aimed at making riding transit safer and more enjoyable. We also appreciate the committee's desire to secure a dedicated revenue source for transit in the metro area and strongly encourage committee members to consider other sales tax increase proposals being heard as they determine the percentage that meets our region's needs. We stand ready to support a proposal that would create the dedicated long-term revenue sources we need to grow and maintain our transportation system. Finally, we wish to remind committee, the committee that transit improvements will make the metro more competitive with peer regions across the country as the young people that make up our future workforce continue to display an ever-growing prioritization of walkable, transit-friendly communities. We encourage committee members to make investments that mean both the near-term and future needs of our transit and transportation systems. Thank you. Thank you so much. Now we have Bentley Graves from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce, followed by Pat Benner. Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Bentley Graves from the Minnesota Chamber of Commerce. At the Minnesota Chamber, I think we have a fairly unique approach uh, as a transportation stakeholder. Uh, we regularly advocate for much needed investment, uh, increased investment in both roads and bridges and transit, but we have a responsibility to balance that against uh, the state's competitiveness as it relates to taxes and the business climate. 
Because of the balance uh, that we seek, we're very appreciative of the fact that uh, this bill brings us uh, down a path to get 100% of the auto parts into transportation. We're very grateful for that. But this, uh, this investment sits alongside $3.3 billion in increased tax and fees over the next four years. $227 million uh, increase in the motor vehicle sales tax, $616 million increase in the delivery fee, uh, $736 million in the tab fee increase, and $2 billion in the metro area sales tax. This is at a time when Minnesota already uh, imposes a much greater tax burden than most other states, and at a time when we're looking at other tax increases uh, coming down the pike this session, including a 0.07% payroll tax at $3 billion just over two years, another quarter cent in the, in the metro area sales tax, and the likelihood of, of other tax increases coming from, uh, from the tax bills yet to be uh, introduced. Our members don't have the luxury of looking at, uh, the, at, at any of this in a vacuum. Um, we've offered some ideas to the committee and to the chair uh, about how to, how to get some additional investment in this system with some greater balance. We'll continue to do that. Look forward to the opportunity to continue that conversation uh, and very much appreciate the opportunity to, the opportunity to provide this impact this, or this feedback this morning. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Now I have Pat Benner from AFSCME Council 5 followed by Caitlin Snyder. Uh, good morning, Mr. Chair. Uh, my name is Pat Benner. I'm a legislative representative with AFSCME Council 5. Uh, thank you, Chair Hornstein, for assembling a transportation bill that meets the moment for what's needed to maintain our roads and bridges. Our roads desperately need new long-term investments, and this bill delivers. Uh, I know I don't have long, so I'll do my best to highlight the pieces we support and have concerns with. Uh, first, I want to thank Chair Hornstein for fully funding the governor's proposals to increase funding for current services. Uh, MnDOT and DPS's ability to recruit and retain a qualified workforce has vastly diminished over the past several years, and jobs that used to have hundreds of applicants with years of experience now remain open. Uh, we need to make these jobs compensation and job descriptions competitive with local units of government and the private sector, and we believe that this bill will do that. Uh, we appreciate the proposals to increase new revenue for transportation. In particular, we support implementing a delivery fee as a novel approach to funding roads and bridges, uh, though we like the other increases as well. Uh, finding new ways to get resources to MnDOT is going to be vital in ensuring that the department can uh, provide the level of service needed to make our roads smooth, clear, and safe so public safety and commerce can commence quickly after a blizzard. Uh, we do have significant concerns about the proposed permanent shift of the auto part sales tax from the general fund in fiscal year uh, 2028 and beyond, uh, though we appreciate the chair's dedication to fully funding transportation. Uh, this shift will hamper other departments with hard to fill positions ability to fulfill their obligations to the state. We prefer the more moderated approach uh, for auto parts in the next two biennia. Uh, last, uh, we appreciate that you included the governor's proposal to increase staffing at DVS exam stations. Uh, the department's uh, capacity to do all the tests uh, has been strained for several years. Uh, this appropriation will fund 30 new testers, and uh, that will uh, help alleviate the backlog and get us back on track. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you very much. Now we have Caitlin Snyder from Education Minnesota, followed by Devin Bruce. Mr. Chair, members of the committee, my name is Caitlin Snyder, and I am a lobbyist with Education Minnesota. I'm here today to testify with concerns about the dedication of the auto sales part tax. Last time I spoke before the committee, a legislator asked why we oppose investments in transportation. To be clear, we do not. Our members, particularly our school bus drivers, drive on the same roads as everybody else. I am here today because every year, teachers, personal care attendants, colleges, and the elderly have to make their best argument in front of legislators about their needs. And yes, sometimes that works out in favor of education, but our students have suffered from two decades of the state not keeping up with inflation and many years of 0% increases on the basic formula. There are no taxes or fees dedicated to our students, to our elderly, to maintaining facilities at the Minnesota State Colleges. Next time there is a recession, funding from the auto parts sales tax won't prevent cuts um, to our children and to our elderly Minnesotans. That may be the wish of the committee, but it does not align with Education Minnesota's values. Funding for nursing homes and schools will be under consideration for cuts in a way that transportation will not be. Lastly, I must point out that this is a regressive tax. All sales uh, taxes on necessities are, but this one is a bit more. There are outliers, but in general, people with lower income drive older cars, which tend to need more repairs, and thus lower income people tend to pay more of this tax. Please keep in mind the values that the committee is considering here as you build your budget. Thank you. Thank you. Now we have uh, Devin Bruce with Mate, followed by Chris Fredson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Uh, for the record, my name is Devin Bruce. I'm the Public Affairs Coordinator for MAPE. I would first like to thank Chair Hordenstein and the committee for including funding for the agency's uh, maintenance for staffing and programming requests included in the governor's budget. We would also like to voice our support for the new revenue streams being proposed in this bill, including the metro area transit sales tax and the service delivery fee, as well as the increases to the current taxes and fees already in law. MAPE supports bringing in new revenue into the mix to address the large need for transportation infrastructure. That being said, uh, we still strongly oppose the full and permanent diversion of the auto parts sales tax away from the general fund. It is poor fiscal policy. Members of this committee and the legislature would be incensed if we used this same mechanism for other areas of the budget, such as dedicating all sales taxes on lumber and paper products, forestry permitting fees solely for reforestation purposes, or all taxes on agricultural property or products such as fertilizers for groundwater pollution mitigation or wastewater infrastructure treatment. Or we could prohibit the use of any other currently non-dedicated general fund money for being used on transportation infrastructure, because that is currently what you're doing for every other area of the budget using this mechanism. The general fund is for general use, and in fact, the $383 million in one-time general fund appropriation to the Trunk Highway Fund illustrates that we aren't lacking money to spend on transportation infrastructure, just lacking the political will to do so. Transportation isn't special in its, lack, uh, in its uh, backlog of unfunded needs. We ask that you oppose the full auto parts uh, permanent dedication for sales tax, and we appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now I have Chris Fredson with Layuna, followed by Maya Emery. Thank you, Chair Tapke, Lee Petersburg, and members of the committee. My name is Chris Fredson. I'm with Layuna. We are Minnesota's infrastructure. Proud to re represent more than 13,000 skilled construction laborers in every corner of the state. We want to thank all of you and your staff for your work to build a safer, cleaner, and more fair transportation system that helps connect all Minnesotans to opportunities. House File 2887 will make our members safer, will create family-supporting construction careers, will help us fix, catch up, and keep up our roads, bridges, and transit. This bill does what, the, what it took the I-35W bridge collapse to do 16 years ago this August. We're grateful for the leaders on both sides of the aisle who did their duty in 2008. Today, we have more than 600 structurally deficient bridges. We have thousands of miles of roads in poor condition. Our roads are a D plus, our bridges a C, and our transit a C minus. We are asking all of you to do your duty to address this growing threat to our health, safety, and prosperity. Let's be honest. Minnesota is facing a $30 billion funding gap just to maintain our current system of state and county highways, local roads and bridges, and transit. Please vote yes for new, long-term, and dedicated revenue to make our roads, bridges, and transit safer for our members and all Minnesotans. Thank you very much. Now we have Maya Emmert from uh, Isaiah, followed by Tim Marino. Thank you. My name is Maya Merritt, and I'm a student at Augsburg University, and I'm also here with Isaiah. For myself and others, access to public transportation is vital to our daily lives. It means going to school, going to work, going to doctor's appointments, grocery shopping, seeing family, or even just exploring the cities for fun. In addition to being a student, I also serve my campus as a sustainability officer for our student government, and so I'm here today to represent our entire student body. In the 2022-2023 academic year, 68% of our first-year class and 61% of our entire undergraduate population are people of color, 54% are first-generation college students, 53% are eligible for Pell Grants, and 20% are received disability services. Providing Metro Transit passes to students has been one of our most successful initiatives as a student government, and we put forward $100,000 uh, to purchase these passes. However, the cost of this program threatens to overtake our budget. If we continue to grow as a campus, we'll be forced to either end this program or severely reduce it. A Metro sales tax for transit and increased transportation would be better lives for students at Augsburg University with more frequent, reliable, and affordable transit. We also ask that you extend this for uh, free and reduced transit for all students because it'll benefit all, all campuses across the metro. And it'll go a long way to reducing carbon emissions, promoting safety as it will limit the number of private cars on the road. Additionally, you should have also all received a letter from University President Paul Privenow because he too believes that this will benefit students, staff, and all visitors to our campus. 
Thank you all for raising, raising new revenue for transportation, and I urge you to consider free or reduced transit for students, as these changes will greatly improve the lives of our college campuses of Minnesota. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Merritt. Uh, now we have Tim Marino, followed by Jesse Cook. Please proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. When riding transit, frequency is freedom. It's not enough to have a line on a map. You have to run it frequently. Especially in our cold winters, a 15-minute wait can easily feel like 30 minutes. Our local service is consistently regaining ridership, but we still must provide frequency, safety, and reliability to win back the trust of our riders. This is proven by the Metro D-Line, which by increasing frequency has recovered approximately 90% of its pre-COVID ridership from the Route 5 bus it replaced during weekdays and surpassed the old ridership it had on weekends. Unfortunately, this will not be cheap. Mary Bogey, the regional administrator for the Met Council, testified before the Senate Transportation Committee on January 9th, saying that if we only restored 90% of pre-COVID service, we would still be facing a yearly deficit of $260.8 million. Our pre-COVID service was good, but not good enough. Our, aspira our aspirations need to be higher. Metro Transit's last service improvement plan in 2015 proposed a lot of upgrades to our system. Some were implemented and some were not, including ones that were not were uh, upgrading 16 routes to 30 minute frequency, 10 routes to 15 minute frequency, new overnight service on five routes, and 20 new routes with all day service in addition to what was running pre-COVID. Now more than ever, in order to meet our climate goals, we cannot go backwards to 90% of what we had. We need the vision to expand our network to similar levels as proposed in 2015. I'm concerned because Section 18, Subdivision 2 of this bill states that only 5 6 of this sales tax is going towards transit, and in Subdivision 3, the Met Council must spend the sales tax revenue on 11 categories annually. Not that those categories are not good things to fund, but that three quarters of a cent will not be enough to show the riders who have remained loyal to our transit system that our best days are truly ahead of us. This is why I urge you to amend this bill and look at increasing funding for transit. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, Jesse Cook, followed by Jamie Poole. Please come up and take the seat that's up there, uh, Mr. Poole. Uh, please proceed. Thank you, Chair, members of the committee. Uh, my name is Jesse Cook, and I'll be speaking briefly on the Minneapolis to Duluth intercity passenger rail. Amtrak has identified the Northern Lights Express as one of the highest potential corridors in the United States. This is, after all, a route that sees a staggering 3.6 billion car trips between the Twin Cities and the Twin Ports every year. 3.6 billion. That's not an easy number to put into perspective. In fact, it's not even possible for the human brain to comprehend factors of nine. But humor me. Imagine just one of those car trips. Maybe it's a family heading north for vacation. Could be a commuter making the trip south for the third time that week. Imagine that person's story. Driving on a particularly treacherous section of I-35 in adverse weather, forced to stay alert, <clears throat> What could be hours of productive or leisure time is instead spent focusing on the icy road and stressing about whether or not traffic will make them late to their meeting or some other commitment. Now imagine that multiplied 3.6 billion times, back and forth, all those commuters, all those tourists, making that journey time and time again. And I ask, how many of those 3.6 billion car trips are necessary? Members of the committee, I urge your support through this omnibus for the future of rail transportation in Minnesota, for the sake of our health, for the sake of our economy, and our longevity. Thank you. Thank you very much, and uh, thank you very much, Ms. Poole, for being here. <laughs> Apologies for that. Um, we've got uh, Jamie Poole, uh, followed by MJ Carpio from Move Minnesota. Perfect. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Jamie Poole, president of the Minnesota Grocers Association. I'm here to respectfully oppose the 75 cent delivery fee being included in the omnibus bill. The Minnesota Grocers Association members consist of hundreds of grocers and convenience stores, many of who are independent, multi-generational, and locally owned. We have over 300 members with 1,300 locations statewide. Access to food is critically important. And as we saw during the pandemic, delivery became an option for many Minnesotans. As a direct result, grocery delivery and curbside pickup has remained a popular option. This service is extremely convenient and in some cases necessary, particularly for elderly and homebound Minnesotans. There's a strong national movement to ensure that SNAP recipients have fair and equitable access to food delivery as well. There are valid concerns this new fee will become a barrier for recipients. We've been assured that non-taxable food items would be exempt, but if a transaction includes a single taxable item, the fee would be applied. 
Many common essentials items in your grocery store are taxable. Our tax code in Minnesota is extremely complex. This will pose confusion for our customers. I'll give you an example. Fruit juice that contains 51% juice is non-taxable. Yet if the fruit juice contains 49% fruit juice, it would be taxable. We ask for an educational component so Minnesotans understand that this is a government mandated fee, not an arbitrary fee placed on by retailers. We've also requested consideration to the cost incurred with administering this new pass-through fee. The ET911 TAM pass-through fee is similar and retailers retain 3% of the combined fee for their administration. These requests are not acknowledged in the bill language but do deserve consideration. <coughs> the pressures on Minnesota's baskets are real. We have presented our questions to the committee and Representative Cagle, and we asked for, uh, we thank her for her meeting with us, but there is still significant work to be done to move from concept to function. We're happy to stand for questions. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, now we have MJ Carpio, uh, followed by Matt Massman. MJ Carpio from Move Minnesota, thank you very much for being here. Hello, good morning. My name is MJ Carpio. I am with Move Minnesota, and we're also part of the Transportation Forward Coalition that uh, promote overall public transit, expanded public transit, biking, walking, and rolling <coughs> infrastructures. Um, there's obviously a lot to get through, so I'll just do my fave four. Uh, I'm really glad that the Local Bus and Transit Improvement Act made it in to the omnibus, uh, which includes fare elimination pilot <coughs> program, transit shelter improvements, zero emission bus transition, uh, bus rapid transit planning, and transit signal priority system planning. Um, also really glad that the transit rider investment program made it into the omnibus, which would recruit much needed personnel um, who can provide rider education, assistance, connection to social services, administration of opiate an antagonists, conflict de-escalation, and so on. Um, and number three, a land use study to help us determine what types of developments are most efficient and least harmful. Put all together, uh, it's very exciting to imagine a Minnesota with a world-class transit system or systems that promote community, freedom of mobility, and equity. Um, finally, as others have mentioned, there's no surplus for transportation. Uh, and regarding the metro area sales tax, until lawmakers and advocates are more open and willing to explore revenue sources, aka taxes, and spending incentives that properly address the environmental and social costs, of our infrastructure designs than this funding source will have to do because it has to for the health of our planet and our people. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, Matt Massman from uh, Minnesota Inner County Association followed by Cap O'Rourke. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair and members. Matt Mossman with the Minnesota Inner County Association representing 15 of Minnesota's larger, faster growing counties in the suburban metro area and across greater Minnesota. Fixing Minnesota's roads and bridges costs money, and there's a lot of fixing to be done. Uh, projected uh, revenues for current law infrastructure are down while uh, our roads are failing and rising costs uh, are finding their way into projects. Substantial one-time funding infusions make a big difference, but ongoing resources are what's needed. We really want to uh, thank and appreciate uh, Representative, Representative Chair Hornstein um, for his support and inclusion of significant revenues to address Minnesota's transportation infrastructure needs. We support the constitutionally dedicated funding, uh, invest in registration tax, the delivery fee, and we support the full dedication of the auto parts sales tax. The county road and bridge system, including both CASA and non uh, CASA roads, accounts for more state lane miles than the trunk highway system. It is among the, the highest volume and most costly roads and bridges, especially in large and more urbanized counties. County roads are estimated to need 1.2 billion in construction costs over the next 25 years, and a gap of 345 million per year annually. Uh, increased reliance on property taxes, local revenue sources like aggregate taxes, local wheelage fees, local option sales taxes have become an increasingly uh, significant source and we believe that state revenues are needed. As the bill moves forward, we encourage the committee to increase distributions to county governments and in a way that helps align funding with jurisdictions to need volume and projected growth. The Metro sales tax, I'll just say uh, quickly, um, we recognize that ensuring uh, community and uh, uh, fair access to employment, uh, school, family, social networks requires a robust uh, transit network. Um, if the Metro sales tax is enacted, we would like uh, to continue working with the chair to consider a larger allocation to highways, granting 
um, highway portion more directly to county governments and incorporating more explicit language about how the funds will be used by Metro Transit. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Mossman. Uh, now we have Cap O'Rourke, the Executive Director with Minnesota Small Cities, followed by Shane Zart. Uh, Mr. Chair and members, uh, my name is Cap O'Rourke with Minnesota Association of Small Cities. We represent the nearly over 700 cities that have populations under 5,000 throughout the state of Minnesota. I want to thank uh, Chair Hornstein and the members uh, for this legislation. Minnesota Small Cities going into this legislative session had three goals. We wanted uh, a need number of at least $40 million per year. Uh, dedicated funding and that had a growth factor. Um, the chair has come very close to meeting all of our goals. Our, our primary concern is that in year one as the phase in of the delivery fee, Minnesota small cities only gets $100,000 and doing the small city, uh, the math on that, that run would not look very good for a lot of small cities. So if there's a way to get more funding and the chair acknowledges this in the first year, uh, it would go a long ways to meeting our needs and finally getting Minnesota small cities a dedicated transportation funding so they can address their over 12,000 miles of roads issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now we have Shane Zart from a coalition of greater Minnesota cities. Well, thank you, Chair and members. My name is Shane Zart with the firm Flaherty and & Hood, and, and speaking today on behalf of the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities, which is a group of more than 100 cities outside of the seven-county metro area. First, I want to echo the previous testifier uh, and thank uh, Chair Hornstein, uh, what's reflected in the bill for small cities, and thank you also to every member who introduced a bill to recognize this as a priority this year. Um, is, uh, but what's re reflected in this bill, as the, the previous testifier uh, indicated, is uh, a, a proposal that is designed to meet the need responsive to the feedback that the committee heard throughout uh, the session about where that need is for small cities and the words ongoing, sustainable, dedicated get thrown around a lot and uh, this bill would, would do that and, and, and grow over time. But also want to thank the, the committee for the elements of the bill that would increase uh, funding received by larger cities, help fill in the, the needs there. And uh, finally, uh, corridors of commerce. I uh, appreciate the additional investments made in the program. Um, I believe, as the, the department's testimony uh, indicated earlier, I, uh, the Coalition of Greater Minnesota Cities is one of the organizations hoping that uh, some of that policy language uh, to better define the program will come through. We understand there's a plan in place to, to move some of that forward, so we'll thank you for that as well. And specifically, the, the coalition would like to see uh, Representative Torkelson's House File 1822 as it was amended in committee as the language that's added in there, uh, if at all possible. So with that, uh, thank you again for all of your work, and, and we look forward to working with the committee going forward. Thank you so much, Mr. Zart. So that was our final testifier we have today, um, and we'll adjourn in just a minute here. But uh, first, and then we'll go to a closing testimony from uh, Chair Hornsey. But first, I want to just make sure that everyone knows that we're back here tomorrow morning at 8.30. So we're here in this room tomorrow morning from 8.30 a.m. to noon, and amendments are due by 2.30 today. So tomorrow we'll be uh, taking amendments um, and going through those. So any closing comments today, Mr. Chair? No, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Chair, members, to all the testifiers. Uh, appreciate your involvement and engagement with this issue. I do want to say one other uh, announcement. The, there are a number of um, policy initiatives that are not included in this bill that have passed through this committee that are in various stages in the process, and uh, we continue to support them. And, uh, you know, they will, you know, stay tuned. They are not off the table uh, just because they're not included in this bill. Uh, we'll be uh, addressing those issues as the session progresses. Perfect. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair. And with that, we're adjourned. <laughs>